This is BC Spritch, your look at the province's burgeoning distilling culture. Welcome to another episode of BC Spritch. Of course, I'm your host, Sean Sewell. This week, I decided to tap, in, tap into a couple of the gins I've got in the selection right now. Um, I should go through all the other old videos and figure out what I've tasted, because we are up into like the high 30s of reviews right now. So I had to like, should go back and rewatch videos to figure out what I've tasted. Um, but I did scrounge up like 12 gins. Uh, we're tasting six of them today. This has all come out of my uh, Fever Tree project that's coming out very shortly. So I've got a good spread of gins for this episode. Uh, we've got fruit and different baselines and different flavor profiles and all this sort of stuff. So let's talk about gin for a sec. Now, there is two different categories of products in BC right now called uh, craft and commercial. I hate the word commercial. I think uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a, a blasé word. Um, so back in the day when the industry first started, um, a lot of people made... Product, uh, the base spirit from scratch. A lot of people bought in uh, neutral grain spirit um, from out east, and then the government sort of shifted the legislation, and a lot of things changed. And so the legislation basically was backing agricultural materials based out of here in uh, in BC. So what that means is that there was a sort of uh, a split between what distilleries can use and make. Now, two very popular. Uh, traditional commercial distilleries, I'm going to call them, um, is of course Long Table and Victoria Spirits. Um, both use NGS. They buy in the product, they distill it off usually one more time, just clean it up, and then they they utilize uh, the traditional botanicals and make a product. Um, a lot of other people, well, majority of distillers in BC uh, support that agricultural movement based on the government's legislation and uh, create products from scratch. So they use grains, fruit, uh, gi uh, honey, um, oh, what else is there? Um, grain, uh, grape, grape, there we go. Um, they use that as their baseline. And so I try not to get into it too much for products, uh, product reviews here on BC Spirits because I find BC Spirits is a neutral um, baseline for the market um, and I want to represent everybody equally. Uh, so, but today I had to explain it because the first gin we're tasting is actually Victoria Gin, which was one of the original bad boys of the, uh, of the BC gin movement, uh, freaking no, 14 years ago, 13 years ago, I think. Uh, I interviewed Peter Hunt a few weeks ago on the podcast, uh, I think two, three weeks ago. Um, but really at the end of the day, I really wanted to sort of show that at that time there were no real rules about distilling, uh, like they are now. And the two OGs would have been Okanagan Spirits and Victoria Gin. So when the legislation came in, you had a choice of which way you wanted to go, and you'd go either way. Now, I don't have an opinion on whether or not which is better and which is worse, or who's got the upper hand, and so on and so forth. There's pros and cons to both camps um, in a huge way, from government perks to taxation to all this sort of stuff. Um, it is to be said that there's a lot of distilleries in London. I think majority of distilleries in London, there's a few that make their base spirit from scratch, all have to use NGS. Um, but what does that mean for you as a gin drinker, as a vodka drinker, as whatever? The great thing is, is that it gives you a ton of variety. Uh, now, you've got honey, honey vodkas and honey gins, and we've got a honey gin today. Uh, we've got a fruit gin uh, we've got a straight grain, we've got corn and potato, we've got another straight grain, then we've got the Victoria Gin. So you've got a whole schwack load of different things in there that give you different flavor profiles, which the botanicals are just added to. And so let's kick this off because I don't want to get too political. Um, I try not to get into the politics, as I said, because BC Spirits is a neutral playing field for everybody, large, small, NGS, whatever. Um, so first up, one of the original bad boys, Victoria Gin. I actually used to make Victoria Gin back in the day with Ken Winchester when he was there um, and when Peter took over. Uh, way back in the day. I think I still was at Moxie's back in the day. So we're probably talking 2008 or nine when this first came out. Um, it's been around for a solid amount of years. 42.5% alcohol, very traditional. Now, you might not know quite as well the Victoria Gin because they make the Empress 1908, which is a huge success. We talked about that a lot in that podcast with Peter Hunt. Um, the 1908 has definitely surpassed everybody's expectations on that one, and we've tasted that one in Flavored Gin episodes. Um, but this one is... It's the classic London Dry Gin. Uh, this is a great sub for your Tanquerays. Your Tanquerays and your, uh, your bigger old school ones, beef eaters, stuff like that. Higher alcohol content gives a lot of flavor profile. 
um, very clean. Works really well on the. I think it's much more like a dried, a dried lemon peel. Your coriander, cardamom, and your juniper are all there. It's a very straightforward, no hold barred, very classic gin. Um, but I had to taste it because, well, it is one of the OGs, regardless of the laws that state now. It's one of the OGs from back in the day. So that's a great one. So next up is this little wonderful little one is uh, one of the newer distillers in BC, uh, Jones in Revelstoke. One of, uh, I think, two distilleries up in Revelstoke. I think Monashe is the other one. Um, these guys are really good little gin smiths. Uh, fantastic. I'm not sure what grain base is on this one because I've done some research. I couldn't find it. Um, I think it's all uh, like Fraser Valley, Peace River uh, grain. Um, but they've done a great job because they've done a, a bathtub series of gins that are infused with teas and a few different botanicals and stuff like that, which is really kind of cool um, as a difference point. Kind of funky on the nose. I'm going to say malted barley for sure. Maybe. Really funky on the nose. On the palate, the funk sort of cuts down. Juniper comes forward. Um, a lot of dried botanicals. Um, I'm not getting a lot of like your citrusy, bright sort of botanicals. It's very like the the woody, earthy sort of botanicals you're going to get there. And then a really great creamy mouthfeel that I knew was going to come from the the funk on the on the nose. Um, play around with this one. It's going to be. Uh, it's a big ballsy gin. It's only it's only thirty seven point five, which is interesting because of the alcohol content being a little bit lower. But um, super grainy. Uh, with nice woody sort of um, hard botanical sort of flavor profiles. So uh, give that one a try. Next up, the Jackknife. So Jackknife from Roots and Wings in Langley. Another, I think there's no other distillery in Langley. It's a bit of a hike out. Like when I went out to Langley the first time to visit Roots and Wings, I think my GPS dropped out like three or four times because there's no service. A uh, beautiful little like tasting room. It's on a, a turf farm. It's amazing. So they use corn and potato for this one. So what does that mean for your base spirit? Your corn and potato is going to give you tons and tons, tons and tons of mouthfeel. Both really hard uh, baseline primary ingredients to ferment and then distill. Corn's a bit of a pain in the ass. So is potatoes. Because changing over your starches into sugar, both corn and potatoes are quite difficult to um, get that sort of, uh, that you have to really high heat and tons of enzymes and a whole bunch of stuff on the nose. Definitely getting potatoes on the nose. If you ever taste tasted potato vodka from Poland, yeah. If you ever get to go out to Roots and Wings and Langley, this is what it like. This is what the area tastes like. It's very primal, um, really leans into that primary ingredient, the corn and the of the potato is a mouthfeel. It's almost like this sort of like, I don't want to say dirty in a bad way, but like this sort of like really musty, beautiful, like botanicals. But then you get the zing of almost a floral um, citrus, like a floral citrus tone on the, on the palate too. But it's really weighty, really heavy, really dense. But then it's got these beautiful like floral lemons, and orange peel and that sort of thing on the palate. Of course, juniper is always going to be a big, uh, big player in the botanical thing. But like when you when you're tasting gin straight like this, you really want to try and get past the juniper because every gin has juniper. If you say, "Oh, it's heavy on juniper," like it, it that's a little bit redundant. You want to sort of try and pick out those other flavors, which is sometimes difficult because the, the juniper really plays around on your palate a lot. Um, try this one. I would say with your sort of citrus, you want to sort of balance out that heavy, weighty mouthfeel that it has um, with some citrus peel and uh, juice. Forty percent alcohol. So, next up, Tate and Bay, forty-two percent. Okay, let's get a good picture of that. Forty-two percent. Now, Tate and Bay's become very, very famous in the last like three months because they were on Dragons Den um, and got backed uh, for Dragons Den. So this is huge. They're up in Invermere, one of the only ones in Invermere. They do a whole bunch of tea infusions, which I've uh, reviewed um, in the past, which are fantastic. But uh, they're straight gin. I've had a, a few times uh, for the Fever Tree Project, so I'm, I'm looking forward to doing this one again. Again, I looked it up. Uh, couldn't find out what their base spirit was made out of, but uh, it's got juniper, lemon peel, coriander, orris root, angelica root. Pretty, like, pretty straightforward, pretty standard stuff. 
Four or five botanicals, very Tanqueray style. And on the palette, that's what it leans into. Oh yeah. This is another classic style gin. Like each gin, like you have to remember guys, craft gins are not a plug and play into replacing Beef Eater or Tanqueray or anything like that. And when people say, oh, I don't know how to use craft gin, craft gin is rubbish, um, so on and so forth. When Hendrix hit the market, no one knew how to use Hendrix because it was so abnormal in comparison to your Tanqueray's and your Beef Eaters and your Bombay's. And they're always like, oh, this is ridiculous. This is not gin at all. Um, so you have to understand, like, when you taste your gins, it's not just a plug and play and swap out things and simple swaps and stuff like that. Everything has its place and everything tastes really good in its place. Um, this one, super classic. I'm, I'm going to put it on the same. So low. you get a little bit more funk from the, the, the grain-based uh, distillate, for sure. But really straightforward. Um, like, you can put this in the well sort of freaking gin. Um, but great one from uh, Tate & Bay. Now we're getting into something a little bit different. These two are going to be super, super interesting. We've got the Couchin uh, gin from Marydale. So this is a fruit distillate that's been aged in stainless steel for three years. Now, what does the aging in three, for your three years do? It takes off the edge. It blows off like certain different alcohols that um, evaporate. Sort of just rounds it off and makes it a little bit more, not palatable per se, because the product itself is palatable, but it just takes off those sort of edges, those little nasty like congestions sort of blow off a little bit. Looking at 47%, so this is a big boy. Like this is only like five or 6% under what a uh, Navy strength would be. Um, but fruit based, you're gonna get a lot of fruitiness on the nose obviously. And exactly, straight away, you're getting like pears, apples, peaches, almost on the, on the nose straight away. 30 botanicals go into this one. Oh. The 47% doesn't hit you too hard. Actually, yeah, it hits you pretty hard. The fruitiness is definitely there. Huge apples and pears, big time. Um, obviously, with the, having the cidery, it's going to be a lot of heavy apple. Um, but then the complexity, once that heat comes down from the alcohol, the complexity of the botanicals and stuff are really going to work their way out really well. This is going to lengthen out really nicely. And when you've got a high alcohol content, when you mix it with tonic and mixes and stuff, it's going to lengthen out but keep that alcohol potency. So you're going to get a really good breadth of um, uh, flavor profile out of each uh, sip. Um, super fruity. Um, again, play around with your white ladies and stuff like that. It'll give us something a little bit different for your white ladies. Uh, but again, a fruity gin that can be used some in a different way um, is always good. And last uh, last but not least is the uh, Salt Spring Island Shine, sorry, Salt Spring Shine Sting Gin. So um, this is a honey based gin. Now, of course, the other only honey there's not too many honey based uh, distilleries here on the in the province. The only other one is of course um, Wayward up in Courtney. Uh, and Dave, I've reviewed his stuff before. Um, this one's a honey distillate. Honey distillates are a pain in the ass, guys. Like, honey's expensive. It changes dramatically if you use them the good stuff. And then to distill it and ferment it is, is not easy at all. So these guys are doing something a little bit different. On the nose, you can tell, like, it's, it's clean honey, but it's almost like a clean, like, solstice method, uh, like a methaglen me mead. Oh, it's clean. The honey's really, really subtle. Like it's a, a it's texture is it something that's there. Like, like a nice um, honeycomb. The botanicals is little citrus notes in there. Um, little citrus notes. Uh, juniper's very piney. It's the first sort of piney, piney gin that I've got out of all these ones. Um, I think maybe because I'm focusing on the base spirit and trying to pick that out. But a little bit of a piney gin. Very Salt Spring Island terroir driven sort of style um, in a big way um, because it's just, uh, it's it's heavy on like what that Salt Spring Island would sort of do for you. So guys, six great gins. Um, some are easy to get, some are not so easy to get. Like most private liquor stores are going to cover most of these. Um, but my suggestion would be to like, do this yourself, like pick up, a, like have a gin party, uh, invite all your friends over, tell them to bring a gin, make a list, 
get everybody a certain gin that they have to go pick up that you can pick up at Vessel or Spinnaker's or Legacy or wherever you're going to be looking at and go and pick up a bottle, bring it to your house, buy a whole bunch of fever tree tonics or a whole bunch of local tonics or tonic water syrup from Rootside and uh, mix it up and see which one's your favorite because you're going to find a favorite. Get outside your tankery and your beefy to sort of like mindset Build out your, your home bar uh, with some cool product. Uh, support local because they support uh, local jobs um, and all that sort of stuff. So there's six gins. I'm going to do six more gins for two weeks' time. Um, something in the middle. I'm, I'm not sure quite yet, but there's going to be something in the middle. But uh, six gins. Have a good week, guys. Thanks for the support. And uh, bye.